listening to the Big Blue Marble Podcast with Anwar Knight. Admittedly, not quite the same as it is in person, but still a soothing sound. I actually recorded that the other day while exploring a local green space. Some researchers say that the sound of a stream registers as non-threatening to our brain. In fact, subconsciously, it's the opposite. It's almost like a gentle whisper of, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Precious words these days, aren't they? There is truly something reassuring about that sound. Of course, it's typically a part of a full package that nature delivers. The surrounding of that running water is equally grounding. And I've come to rely on that more this year than probably any other. 2020 has been quite a year. Hello, my friends. Thanks so much for joining in. I'm Anwar Knight here on the Big Blue Marble Podcast. I'm sure you're not surprised when I tell you that I love nature. I actually need nature. And I think we all do. I launched this podcast in an effort to help nature, to help our Big Blue Marble. You know, there's a huge cogwheel of change needed if we hope to have a healthy and balanced planet for the next generation. My kids, your kids, grandkids. So as we spin personal actions in motion, at the same time, we need science, technology, corporations, businesses, and most importantly, political and social movements to also be in motion. On today's show, I wanted to put an important spotlight on a bill that the Ontario government is hoping to pass, a bill that could have irreversible consequences for communities all across the province. It will impact what conservation authorities can do. In fact, it will hinder their role in regulating development and municipal planning applications on environmentally sensitive lands, build flood resilience in the face of climate change, and preserve critical natural features. My guest today is the CAO of the Credit Valley Conservation Authority. CVC owns and manages over 7,000 acres of land for habitat protection, community recreation, and flood hazard management. And the Credit River watershed is comprised of 1,000 square kilometers of land drained by the Credit River in its 1,500 kilometers worth of tributaries. It is located in one of the most rapidly urbanizing parts of the country. Now, the CVC is one of three dozen different conservation authorities in the province. They have trained specialists, hydrologists, ecologists. They are the best qualified to understand the impacts of development on key environmental features. And I realize there are many, many people who are unaware of what they do. Some of you may not even realize that they exist, and that's okay. So I thought, let's find out together today what conservation authorities do, why the oversight that CAs provide is so crucial, and most importantly, I hope we inspire you to get involved. Your voice counts, because simply, conservation matters. For the latest stories on our changing planet, plus show updates and an exclusive look behind the scenes with Anwar Knight in studio, visit BigBlueMarble.org. Deborah Martin Downs is my guest. She is the CAO of the Credit Valley Conservation Authority, based just west of Toronto in the city of Mississauga. We appreciate your time today, Deborah. Well, thank you, Anwar. It's nice to be here. You know, I really wanted to have you on to, to help us understand what conservation authorities do. Uh, they are, in my books, unsung heroes, especially, you know, when we consider that 95% of Ontario's population lives in a watershed that is managed by a conservation authority. And there are 36 in the province. So virtually all of us are benefactors, but I thought let's begin there. What is the primary role of a conservation authority? Well, authorities were formed to further, and this comes from the act, the conservation, restoration, development, and management of natural resources. And that's natural resources that don't include oil and gas and minerals. So we do that on a watershed basis, which is uh, not, uh, that means to say that we don't do it by political or municipal boundaries, but we use natural boundaries of how the environment actually works. So conservation authorities tend to be specialists in watershed management, meaning that we look at changes on the land, such as tree cover or development or gravel pits, for example, to understand what impacts there might be on water, whether that be flooding, drought, water quality from runoff of salt or fertilizers, 
And then we are enabled to find ways to address the problem through protection or restoration or management actions. And we do that like things like tree planting and stream restoration, working with landowners such as farmers to improve their land practices. We also acquire land and do we do urban stormwater management, uh, just to name a few things that, uh, that we get engaged in, all in the name of managing natural resources on a watershed mm. basis. And I would imagine based on the geographical region that each conservation authority is operating from, the priorities and aspects of land management would vary greatly say rural farm regions in southwestern Ontario, that would be quite different than it would be in northeastern Ontario, right? Exactly. And that's that's one of the unique and uh, valuable components of a CA is that they were they're done locally with a local municipality and that that in doing so they are working hand in glove to try and address the concerns and issues in the watershed at the at that place and those those particular issues not one size fits all and you mentioned flooding and that's not only the leading cause of a, of a public emergency here in Ontario but it's also the most costly natural hazard in the province absolutely and, and in certainly what I do for a living it's not hard <laughs> to find examples it seems almost every year if not every other year, that we have a serious flood event. You can go back to 2013. I think many people will recall after those intense rainstorms uh, flooded the Don River and people were trapped on the GO train and they had to rescue them by boat. That in itself was a billion dollar storm. 2019, the Great Lakes had record water levels because they had to limit the outflow in the eastern sections of the province because they had flooding there. And even just last weekend with the windstorm, there was shoreline flooding on the shores of Lake Erie. Oh, absolutely. But I, I, I think the the, the takeaway here is, is what started it all. And I, I, I'm hoping my research is correct. The most significant flooding event in Toronto's history dates back over 60 years ago when Hurricane Hazel hit. 81 people were killed. It's estimated now it's probably a billion dollar damage in today's current dollar value. And, and that was a catalyst, was it not, of let's create an agency that would help prevent something like this from ever happening again. Well, Anwar, before I started with the conservation authorities, I thought that was the same thing too, but actually it's not correct. The Conservation Authorities Act was first passed in 1946. So that's 10 years before Hurricane Hazel hit the, the GTA. And I'm, I'm glad that you raised this because as I mentioned earlier, CAs were initially set up to address significant issues in places like the Oak Ridges Marine where deforestation for agriculture resulted in things like soil erosion, which increased runoff, which led to flooding. And in fact, when, when you have more flooding, you also can have more drought because the water isn't retained on the land. And of of course, poor agricultural conditions where soil was, was eroded. So the, at the time, there were a number of conservation organizations that got together in the early 40s to figure out how to fix this. And, you know, frankly, I think that's pretty amazing when you consider what was going on in the 1940s in the world. So the CA Act was the result of these organizations saying we have to improve the environmental condition of our of our watersheds. So what we learned then was that we had to let the floodplains do the work they were intended to do. We constrained them in the early years with development and uh, by doing so, we put that development at risk. And we saw that in Hurricane Hazel, as you noted, there's huge damages and we lost a whole street in the Humber River was taken out, Raymar Drive, which was washed away in that storm. And with that, people who were in their homes sleeping at the time and they were washed away. And certainly the, the response to Hurricane Hazel meant that we added into the CA Act, the powers to control waters to prevent floods pollution. And that allows us to regulate the floodplain and other natural hazards such as steep slopes and wetlands and shorelines over time. And that allows us to protect people from, from ever having that happen again. And I can only assume here, but when you say the 1940s, could it be that Ontario was the first in the world to do something like this? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that, in fact, Ontario is unique. Uh, even in Canada, we're the only ones who have a conservation authority model. There are many people who have watershed-based organizations, but the conservation authority model is very unique. All the more reason to keep it intact. 
Is there a, an initiative or project that you regard as a, as a true success story for conservation authorities? Well, I think certainly I would say the, the most uh, the true success story that the CAs have been responsible for is that they, we've kept people safe from flooding for over 60 years. So we have not had the disasters that some of the other uh, countries have, and even in the U.S., which we've seen some devastating flooding. I mean, New Orleans, for example, back in 2013 as well. And yes, we've had a lot of flooding, but people haven't died because their houses were swept away. But in doing so, and I think this is the this is the the silver lining in the fact that we had Hurricane Hazel, is that we have a legacy of green spaces now that are part of our communities. That we have allowed the river valleys to do their job be by putting them back, allowing them to be floodplains and do the work that they need to do. But in doing so, they are now the green spaces, the ravine systems of the city of Toronto. We have out opportunities for outdoor recreation, trails, and even some of our conservation areas, which are in the, all over uh, southern Ontario or all over Ontario as well, but uh, particularly around the GTA, where so many people have recreated, especially now with, with COVID, they have been uh, little havens for everyone. But those recreational areas, those conservation areas, or some of them were formed uh, or purchased in order to provide flood control solutions, which were never actually realized. So somewhere like Boyd Conservation Area in Vaughan was to have been a big dam, which never was built. So instead, we now have a beautiful conservation area for people to enjoy. Yeah, I've been there many times. Beautiful hiking trails that, that wind through the Humber River Valley there. And also a great example of what CAs help establish. I don't think many people realize that there are more than 300 conservation areas in Ontario that provide public access and almost double that in terms of actual green spaces. And I was pleasantly surprised to learn that conservation authorities actually secure or acquire land through partnerships. In fact, 150,000 acres of land. So can you tell me a little bit about that process? What is taken into consideration before a conservation authority will purchase land and what is the main reason for that? So there's a couple of ways we, we, we purchase or we accept land and one is through the development process. So today in, in the development process, if, if you were creating a subdivision that happened to have a, a stream valley or a, a, a wetland on it, that usually those pieces of land are conveyed to a public body, either a conservation authority or the municipality. The other, we do actually go out and seek out lands that are part of our Greenlands acquisition strategy. We often try and secure lands that are sensitive, so wetlands and forested areas. We also try and uh, add to holdings to make larger parcels. So in the Credit Valley, for example, we have a number of areas where we, we target lands that are adjacent to a particular holding that allows us to expand uh, for trails. One of our big initiatives right now is the Credit Valley Trail, which we are doing, takes a trail from Port Credit to Orangeville. It's going to be about 100 kilometers long. And so we are targeting lands that would be along the route of the trail that are not already in public ownership. So, so we have a number of, of sort of objectives of obtaining those lands. And more recently, we're more interested or very, very interested in obtaining lands that have some recreational potential as well as preservation potential. So to provide more park spaces, which we, again, through COVID have really demonstrated that we don't have nearly enough of. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just imagine if we didn't have what we have now, though. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> truly. Well, um, you know, one of the statistics that I'll throw out to you is that we've been looking at the number of visitations we've had just at Credit Valley Conservation Conservation Areas since 2010. And between 2010 and 2019, we've had a 260 percent increase in visitations to our conservation areas. And then over 2019 to today, and this was just a statistic we had at the end of August, we've had a 40% increase in visitation. So we're going to have new numbers or numbers finished up shortly as the year comes to an end. But those numbers, because of the growth in the, in the GTA and because of people living in smaller places and more vertical, obviously in condos where they don't have access to green space. So they're, they're loving those spaces, but uh, we have to continue to add to the, to the inventory or we're going to find ourselves ruining the places that people have come to love. Yeah, that's the double-edged sword, isn't it? You want people to utilize the green spaces, but it's a learning curve at times <laughs> and teaching them to take care of what they have. Exactly. Uh, but the thing is, you know, 
know, it is so well documented how connecting with nature helps your mind and body. There are so many benefits. And for those listening outside of the GTA, on CTV News, where I work each day, I have been broadcasting exclusively outdoors since March. When the COVID crisis peaked and the lockdowns were in place, we've been going live on location at different parks all across the region, in part for safety, you know, away from crowds, being outdoors, but also to deliver a piece of nature for our viewers and to show that although the list of things that you cannot do is long, you can connect with nature. Here are some green spaces where you can go, you can take a deep breath, listen to wildlife, maybe discover a flowing stream. Parks that you may have passed hundreds of times not knowing what gem is at your doorstep. I'm wondering though, Deborah, if the conservation authorities did not acquire, secure, however you want to phrase it, certain green spaces, who else would and, and what would happen to them? Well, some of those green spaces are acquired by the municipality. And uh, for example, we have green spaces that we own in the city of Mississauga, but Mississauga actually operates them for us. So that's also t a type of partnership and who does things. But the, the developers could, and they did for many years, retain the hazard lands that went with their properties. No one else could, you, they certainly couldn't build on them. But what uh, I think through the years, we determined that the trails and linking, linking those systems publicly was a real value to the community. And so that's certainly a, a major objective, whether it's ourselves or our local municipalities that own it, it doesn't really matter because we both have the same objective to provide uh, public access. So let's get to the issue at hand. The, the main objection <laughs> to this proposed uh, provincial bill, Bill 229, Schedule 6, and this has been, at least it appears to be quietly snuck in because the document itself, the budget document was 250 pages. There were a whole host of proposed amendments to provincial acts, but one of them affects the Conservation Authorities Act of 1990. So what is the main objection with this particular bill? Well, if I could step back just a little bit, is that we've been going through a review of our act now since 2015. So five years we've been doing this, all in the attempts to modernize our act. So the, the Liberals started this in 2015 and did some um, significant stakeholder consultation. And they ended up in 2017 with changes to the act that were passed in December. So then when the new government came in, in June of 2019, they also, they had proposed, made some proposals on, in the act and they passed that in June of 2019 under Bill uh, 108. And then over the last winter, early in January and February, they did some consultation with stakeholders. And then that's the last we've heard of it. And then Lo and behold, in the but inside a budget bill, inside a schedule, tucked in the back, there is changes to the Conservation Authorities Act, which came as a complete surprise to us. We had no idea they were that they were doing this. So that's un unfortunate, and that we we were not part of the process in helping to craft what these uh, additional changes need to be. So, having said that, the the first part of the changes they made back in. June of 2019 was to limit the work that we're mandated to do. And then if it's limited in the mandate, that also means the municipalities only have to pay for what's in our mandated area. So, so they wanted to have programs and services around three mandatory program areas. So that was hazards, which we have been doing for 60 years, so no surprise. Conservation and management of conservation authority owned lands. So that's uh, important to us to be able to pay our taxes and keep our properties safe. They added source water protection to that, which we have been doing for the past decade, coming out of the Walkerton tragedy. And then there's a fourth area that is part of it, which is the lakes, uh, but it only pertains to Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority around the Lake Simcoe Protection Act. So the details that's in those, what, it, what are going to be in those programs, and therefore what the municipalities will be able to are expected to support us in are going to be described in regulation. And those haven't been released. We're hearing that that's going to come in the next few weeks. But as well, the Conservation Authority community has not been engaged in helping to craft those regulations. So we need to ensure that the programs and services that we are mandated to offer, that the right, that the right tools and the right elements are included in the regulations. And then anything that's not included in the mandatory programs, we have to uh, negotiate municipality by municipality to undertake. So it's really important that we get the regulations right and that they, we don't leave any functions out. 
So um, going to this new act then, out came a number of additional measures, some of them around transparency of the CA acts, actions, including the board and things we need to post like minutes and agendas and and things like that but we're already we've already been doing that and so i don't think that that for us it wasn't a, a necessary it's not a surprise and it's not something that we weren't already doing but a couple of things that were very concerning to us is that the the new provisions in the act give the minister of environment of natural resources and forestry who is responsible still for the um, section 28 or the flooding part of our reg of the ca act it gives him the power to come in and issue a permit instead of the conservation authority before or after we have completed our review and there is also appeal mechanisms to the minister directly and also they've created a second appeal mechanism to the local planning appeal tribunal as known as the LPAT. So there's two two sets of appeals that could happen and both of which can happen without our our, our agreement with they're, they're bypassing you. without yeah with exactly bypassing us completely. And that what that means is that the minister doesn't have access to our data to our local tools to the local conditions and to make make a science based or an informed decision. And we think that could have ter terrible uh, consequences potentially down the line. We only have one chance to make development right and because you no one's going in there to take away those homes later on. And then there is an, you know, I, mean, I think it's in fairness, there is an appeal mechanism now and it goes through the mining lands tribunal right now. So if someone was denied a permit, they certainly can appeal and they do periodically. But we looked at the, the permits across all the CAs for 2018, as it was a, a recent year we rolled up. We had over uh, about 11,800 permit applications received. 10,800 were actually permitted and only 28 were appealed. So that says it's not, as, as one of my colleagues used to say, it's not a, it is a permitting activity, not a stopping activity. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, it's not a routine activity that there's a lot of appeals going on because we work really hard with uh, municipalities and proponents to try and get the best solution for both of us. Our biggest concern then is that if the minister comes in and he issues a permit without science, without data, and it also has no backup. So who's going to enforce the conditions on that permit? Who's going to ensure the liability is, is taken? Because this conservation authority would normally do that, but we were no part of the permit process. And if our board would have denied that permit, then who's going to take responsibility for that? So, so they, we think there's a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, and I wondered about that. Who or what government body would fill the gap here to, to oversee what conservation authorities originally would have done? Well, in, a, in an area where there is no conservation authority, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry staff do provide flood forecasting and warning services, and they do uh, assist proponents, but they don't have a, a regulation activity. They would not be resourced to do so because we have been resourced to do it. So as far as I can tell, the, the next, the only next possible body to do this would be the municipalities. And they have been relying on us to do these things for many years. So it's uh, difficult, you know, difficult to keep putting more of these requirements on the municipalities when they already have plenty on their plate. And I gather the primary reason on why the, the provincial government wants to make these changes uh, is to quicken the process of developing uh, or develop mint and, and permits to encourage more of it. Would that be accurate? I think that that's one of the things they want to do is that they want to get things built faster and, and we get that too. And I, But I also think there's a lot of people out in particularly in the rural lands who don't want to be regulated. And, and we get that as well. And farmers, for example, say, why are you here? Why are you regulating my property? And I've had those conversations with a few. And one of the interesting things that sometimes we don't explain very well is that we want to make sure that whatever happens upstream doesn't affect your either uh, ability to have water or not to be flooded out or that whatever you're doing on your property doesn't flood someone else out upstream or flood someone else downstream and once you explain that to them is i don't really care i, I care what you do but really i just want to make sure that what you're not what the, what you're doing is to ensure that the safety and 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 
protection of the water supply for someone else. And they usually understand that once we explain mm -hmm. it. But sometimes I think we assume people understand what we're doing and we have to do a better job of, of actually communicating about our role and why we're doing it. You know, when it comes to developers, and, and I don't know if you, you're able to even answer this because every developer is different, but in your experience, you know, why wouldn't a developer want to include proper environmental assessment and, and protection in their proposal? Would it basically just be the cost because it affects their bottom line? Well, I think that's it's partially true that there's a, a bottom line component, but I think it's also that their job is to build the the infrastructure and the housing the housing for the communities and they the faster they can get that done the faster they can move on to another project so we understand that part and that you know so it my business is environment i don't build the houses their business is building the houses and they don't do environment so so i think sometimes there's that lack of understanding about what is required and how it gets done and typically they come with a cadre of consultants to help out, but that's the, the larger guys, uh, in the, particularly in the GTA, they're, they're in that business and they've been doing it for a long time and they're, and they're quite well versed in it. But I think a smaller community, maybe someone who doesn't have the same resources, they're going to find it a more difficult process. And so again, in, in my shop, we, draw, we try and make sure we work with people and sit down and help them through the process, but not everybody has the resources to do that. Uh, a lot of our conservation authorities are very small. They have, you know, five and six staff. I have 200 and some staff, so it's a very different level of ability to respond and help, help clients. It's estimated that in southern Ontario alone, almost 70 percent of its wetlands have been lost, largely through development and agriculture. So, I, I, and the reason I mentioned that, because you know, this isn't the 70s. We're at a point now where we really have to be conscious of what's going on with our environment because the repercussions are starting now to really unfold. So, and I find it troubling that anybody now, I get it if you're a developer, you, you're, you're a business, you're, you're trying to make money, you, you develop, you know, an area of land and that's what you do. But there has to be Full circle here, we all really have to come together and think about not short-term gain, but long-term future. And, and that's from the consumer level to developers to government. We really all have to be on the same page. And I, I'm quite frustrated that even in this day and age, with so many examples of what's going on, on how the earth is changing, that there's still a wrestle here. Like, why can't we just all get it that we all have a role to play. Well, you know, I think this is a, it's a difficult thing. And I, I would kind of liken this to the tragedy of the commons. So the runoff goes into our streams and the streams go into our lakes and they're common, they're commonly held elements of uh, in, in the province owns them or they, or they, the public owns them, but they never, they can't they can't manage them so they only deal with what they can see and the and we push those those potential issues off to future generations and we see that with lake erie we see that with communities that are in in flood prone areas we see that with stormwater because before we understood that stormwater was a problem it went uncontrolled into our into our rivers which caused erosion but it was kind of like well that's in the valley that doesn't affect me but it does it affects you a lot with with potential infrastructure being eroded and destroyed so there's it's it's not in the same if if a developer had to pay for the destruction of uh, downstream or contribute to restoration of downstream impacts, you would probably see a different kind of solution. Today, they're working with us to implement something called low impact development on a site, which means that the water moves more naturally through the landscape. One of the beauties of that is that it actually is typically less expensive to, to develop using low impact development than it is to use uh, a big pond which takes up land which has development value. So there's an incentive there already. Yeah, so we've got a lot of folks, a lot of the development community who's very interested in doing that because they can see that it actually uh, is a cost savings. And then working through it, helping to, them to work through the process faster, you know, to sit down with them and do pre-consultations and to, to say, well, this isn't likely going to work, but if you do this and bring it in that way, we can make that happen. And so part of that is having that dialogue, not unlike the dialogue we want to have with the province, is 
let's talk about it before you put something down on paper that we may have to back off of, right? And that's always a hard thing to back off something you've already put down. Well, where does the bill stand right now then? Well, uh, understanding now that they are on second reading, so they are debating it with the various parties. They have just uh, announced today that they'll have committee hearings between November 30th and December 2nd. But the legislature rises for Christmas break on December 10th. So as far as we know, everything's got to be done before then. So so we're racing through at this point. <laughs> and, uh, so there's certainly interest in getting the budget uh, approved and, and because it's way late. And, and as we were very supportive of the government having a, a budget to operate under. Well, and then, you know, you throw in a pandemic in between all of this, right? <laughs> in fact, never seen anything like it. You know, it. <laughs> uh, I mean, and not just, you know, now they're record numbers, and I shouldn't even be laughing about it, but we're reaching no. a point now that, yes. I mean, this is, it's becoming crucial. So let me ask you this before we can, you know, steer our listeners and how we can help here. As an agency, is there any possible recovery strategy should this bill be passed for CAs? Well, you know, I think from a recovery strategy, it's quite, quite clear that the bill can be opened and changed again, but but we can't wait five years for that to happen because the decisions that get made potentially under this bill will last a lifetime. People or projects are allowed to destroy wetlands, which we've already, as you mentioned earlier, we've already done so many of those in the past, and that has had an impact on our flooding. If they can build in natural hazards, they're there forever. And ultimately, the taxpayer's on the hook to bail them out. And we've got so many examples of that in the GTA, where we have historical communities that were built uh, before conservation authorities. So Hogs Hollow in the GTA for in the city of Toronto, for example. In Mississauga, we have Cooksville Creek, where a number of, of homes were built in the floodplain before, before we were able to address those things. And in fact, Mississauga today is attempting to buy out those houses from the floodplain so they can create a park because they recognize that the cost to continuing to address the, the flood impacts to these communities are, are just too great. And a lot of, as you mentioned earlier, some of the community, the homeowners can no longer get insurance for those, for those flood prone areas. So that becomes a problem. So we have very significant taxpayer, taxpayer impacts because we have we have historical development where it shouldn't be. Lake Erie shoreline is, you know, the houses, some of them are literally being torn down because they've been bombarded by, by waves and by erosion. So those, those things will ultimately be the taxpayer on the hook for, and as well, the, the, the community. So, so we have, there, is there coming back? Yes, there's always coming back because basically that's what the Conservation Authorities Act did in 1946, is it said we have to come back from the land conditions that we've created. But we know better. We know better. We have science that says this is how we need to do things. So we know better and we need to apply that science. And that science has helped us also understand the importance of having a thriving ecosystem. Something you know very well. You're not only the CAO, but also an aquatic biologist. <laughs> So there really is an incredible advantageous relationship for an entire community when you have a steward such as conservation authorities there to nurture and protect wildlife habitat. Exactly. You know, I think that's, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people say, oh, I don't care about the birds or I don't care about the trees or whatever. But but that's what makes us unique. It gives us a, a place to, as you mentioned earlier, the, it's for our mental health to a reprieve, a, you know, an action. A lot of people, there's a lot of people who are bird watchers. I think you probably know that. Fishermen, you know, we uh, just recently we were out in Meadowville Park to do a little filming for something. And we had to keep stopping because the fishermen kept coming by and going into the river because the salmon were running. And, uh, you know, it, so these guys had literally, you know, walked over from probably their houses to, to come fishing, you know, and you to, to be able to do that in the city is such a remarkable thing. And we, you know, we, that's one of the things we are trying to do is to protect that, that ability for people not to have to drive to Algonquin Park to see wildlife, but that they can do it in their backyard. So that means that we, you know, we do monitor things that is potentially at risk with, with the changes to the, or what we are mandated to do. We're hoping that the province sees the value in our monitoring and the data and the science that we're able to produce that helps us make good science-based decisions. 
that it also helps us make good communities. So we, we've defined areas to protect, we've gone in and planted trees or managed invasive species in those areas to try and protect that biodiversity. You know, I, I, we kind of liken it to, what if you could only have corn and potatoes in your diet for the rest of your life? You know, would you be happy with that? So what if we only had two species of plants or one species of bird because that's all that can survive here? And I don't think that makes us a good community and it certainly doesn't make us resilient. So one thing wipes that out. And as you probably know, we've had something called emerald ash borer. What if all our trees were ash and the emerald ash borer is coming in and taking down or killing every tree? We wouldn't have any trees left if we only had one kind. I, I often say that to my boys. I have a five, I now just turned six, in fact, six and eight year old. <laughs> nice. And, and I often say to them, imagine what this place would be like without trees, you know, any landscape for that matter. And I think nature really is such a remarkable tool to utilize to help teach kids empathy. <laughs> That's right. You know, yes. it, it, it's, it's so true because, you know, to a, a six year old, you are a giant to an ant. But there's a connection, there's an engagement. And, and I think those are the building blocks of, of, of when you're, you're trying to nurture, you know, a young child to become eventually an adult, and especially what's going on in the world right now, to be able to break away from, you know, your lockdown, the stress, my kids are doing online schooling. Let's, let's go to a park and let's connect with nature. And, you know, you would think it, it's, it's not a hard sell to convince anyone that conservation matters, especially these days. <laughs> Absolutely, I would hope not. <laughs> you, you would hope not. So how do we help you? What can the public do to, to you know, let our voice be heard? Well, I would say a couple of things. One is that understand who your conservation authority is and what they do, you know, get informed and, and perhaps come and, you know, get to know us, participate in a tree, you can't do it right now, but participate in a tree planting or go to a conservation area and, and learn a bit more about, about the environment that's around you. So that's a start and, and people I would hope uh, would understand a little bit more about their local environment by doing so. Right now with this bill, when they were asking that anyone who's concerned should call or write their MPP, as well as the Premier, the Minister of Finance. It's his bill. Uh, it's his budget bill, which our bill does not belong in a budget bill, but the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, he's, uh, it's their legislation in that bill. Uh, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, and as well as the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, and I mentioned him and I, and I failed to say so earlier, but one of the significant changes in this bill is that we have been Den we will be denied the right to appeal a decision that is not favorable to the to the ha to the hazard lands. So, so it will be that we absolutely cannot participate in that, and that is something that it's a tool in our toolbox. We don't use it very often, but when we do, we need it. So, and then we have some of our colleagues uh, through Ontario Nature, for example, has a has a web has a connection on their website. It's very easy to enter your postal code, determine who your MPP is, and it uh, automatically generates a letter to be sent to your MPP. So it's it's very simple, uh, simple process. What we're asking them to do is, you know, we we while we believe the budget bill should should be completed, they need to take Schedule 6 out of the budget bill. Because it's in a budget bill, there's no public consultation with it. It's part on the environmental registry. It basically says, hey, it's a budget bill. We don't have to consult, so we're not going to. And and in that case, you need to have, pro in, in for this act, you need to have proper public act process about the legislation, especially when public safety can be at risk. You know, and I, I think this is what makes it especially prob problematic is that it was already very difficult for the community concerned citizens to raise flags for a development plan that might be happening in their region, their neighborhood. Because although the documents are, are publicly available, it's not easy to source. No. On many occasions, <laughs> you know, many times it might be just the local newspaper that shines a dim light that gets it started initially. And I say dim light because these days even local media resources are shrinking by the day. Mm -hmm. So if this proposed bill is approved, the public voice is truly gone. And as you mentioned, you can't get green space back once it's developed. Exactly. Uh, so uh, th this is this is the the chance you know as i mentioned earlier in the show for our listeners and this has sort of been the reoccurring theme here in the big blue marble podcast if you've ever wondered what can one person do 
to help nature, to help the earth. You may have never signed a petition. You maybe never planted a tree in a community tree planting event. But we all benefit from what conservation authorities do. They are the boots on the ground ensuring that the environment is protected. So this is something that you can do. You can let your voice be heard so we can tell. Uh, and I'm going to put a list of all of those contacts in today's show notes. Great. Plus the email link. But we got to let our representatives know you got to scrap this. I mean, th this is not a good thing to do, especially these days with climate change. You know, it is in fifth gear. We need to pull back and nature has to be a priority. We need to stand up. So I want to thank you, Deborah, because I think this has really helped. It was a, a terrific overview on why we need conservation authorities. And, and this is a chance that we all can rally together and make some changes for the better. Well, thank you, Anwar, for shining a spotlight on this. So we appreciate your support. Deborah Martin Downs has been my guest. She is the CAO of the Credit Valley Conservation Authority. And just to recap, I have a full list of all of the key people that you can email in today's show notes. Plus, I've included a sample email if you want to simply cut and paste. Of course, I encourage you to write your own concerns and reasons and why you don't want this bill to pass. But there's also a link. I, I know we are very busy, especially as we get closer to the holidays. I've put another link at the very bottom and everything is set up for you. All you need to do is put in your name, address, and postal code, and it automatically finds your local MPP. Deborah mentioned this, so it'll fire off the email to everybody. But I hope we can count on you. You know, conservation authorities deliver practical, cost-effective programs that nurture human health, ecological health, and economic health and we need to stand up here as always i want to thank you for your continued support on social media twitter and instagram and on facebook you can follow me at anwar knight that's a-n-w-a-r knight with a k on facebook it's anwar knight tv and be sure to subscribe to this podcast you can do that right from the home page at bigbluemarble.earth please share this show and let's all work together and stand up for nature that's it for now stay safe be well and let's take care of one another. I'm Anwar Knight, wishing you a great day on the Big Blue Marble. That was another great show, Daddy.